Well, hello, and welcome to the Pen to Publish podcast from the two Alexas. If you're penning and publishing, or even just planning to pen and publish, you're in the right place. I'm Alexa Witten, author, typesetter, and independent publisher, and... I'm Alexa Tewksbury, author, editor, and proofreader. You can never have too many Alexas. We love getting feedback, so do please review and subscribe. And we also have a group full of like-minded writers, which you can join over on Facebook and get your writing results happening. It's called The Writer's Refinery, and the link will be in the show notes that accompany these podcasts. So let's get started. Well, hello there, and welcome to episode four. We're halfway through, Alexa. Oh, I know people probably think oh they're always saying this but honestly when you're recording episodes and then you suddenly think wow and then and then when I'm I'm queuing the episodes up to go out and it's just like in next to no time the whole series has gone out I know it's um it's it's just time isn't it just slow it down a bit (laughs) anyway today we're going to be looking at printing options for your book So you've got it written, you've got it edited, you've got it typeset and all the other things that we've talked about in the last four series. So now it's getting your book into physical form. Now, when I was writing my notes for this, I thought, hey, do you know what? This is going to be a really easy episode to record because there's not a lot to say on this one. But then I started writing and I realised that actually there is quite a lot of info. So what you might need to do is listen to this one more than once or when you get a sec, make some notes as you go on. I've tried to make this as simply as I can, but actually there is quite a lot to think about. So I'm really sorry, but it's kind of not my fault. (laughs) It's entirely your fault, you know, just exactly. (laughs) So this is the most exciting, but also the most scary part for, for the majority of authors, because And actually, funnily enough, this is the bit that authors delay their pressing the print. Well, I suppose these are big decisions. What you choose now is actually going to become your physical product. So there's a lot riding on getting it right, because once it is your physical product, you you might have to wait till your next print run to change something. And by that time, you've sold a lot of books. Well, it's not really that because I always have a fail safe if they get a printed proof first so they can actually see it in their hand. What I think most authors are actually scared of now is that their book is going to be seen. That's that's more than more than how it's going to be seen. It's the fact that it is now going out into the world. And authors just pretty much I would say it's 50-50 split where authors just don't want to take that next step because they're scared and I totally get it I totally understand why because it's the bit where your virtual thing becomes a physical thing and if you've listened to us and have done all the steps that we recommend then this bit is the most exciting certainly for me so you've got to take a deep breath because you've got a book sitting on your computer and you need to follow through and get it out into the world I gave a talk at Seven Stories recently about this very subject. It's the old imposter syndrome kicking in, and it's very common. But my bit of advice, if you're feeling like this, is to look at it this way. You're doing your readers a disservice if you don't get that book into their hands. When you look at it that way, it's amazing how you can then get out of your own way, stop procrastinating, and get the thing printed. Can I just dive in, just in case you don't know what Seven Stories is? It's the National Centre for Children's Books in Newcastle, isn't it? Newcastle upon Tyne. And I believe it's actually based in a seven story building. It is. Which is why it's called Seven Stories. Yes. (laughs) And I was honoured to be able to give a talk about the imposter syndrome because it's really important that you understand what it is, why you might then be delaying in print. Anyway. So that's enough about why you should print the book. Let's dive into how to do it. So the first thing to consider is what type of casing you want. Do you want softback or hardback? Now, most first time authors go for the softback option as it's the most economical way of printing your book. However, if you want a hardback, then you'll need to look at what type of casing you want. Do you want one that has a dust jacket? Or do you want one, and and a dust jacket, as you know, is the removable piece of paper that uh, covers the whole book? Or do you want a casing that is printed, you can have a a vinyl casing 
that where your book cover is printed directly onto the cover so you don't have a dust jacket. Amazon offer a hardback printing and I know Ingram do as well and they include a dusk jacket option. I'm not sure if Amazon does yet. I think Amazon only offer a hard cover option where you print directly onto the cover. But be warned, it's a very expensive way of printing your book. One of my authors was adamant on getting a hardback version of her book with a dust jacket printed on it through Ingram, but it ended up costing more money to print it than it did to sell. So she was losing money anytime someone ordered a version. So be aware, hardbacks are expensive. They are lovely to have, but they are extremely labor intensive to produce, hence the price it costs to create them. So do think long and hard about whether or not which option you want, softback or hardback. I'd imagine most people are going to get softback options. I mean, as a reader, not specifically to do with the price, but I actually prefer the feel of a paperback. I don't know. I, I, I would much rather I feel more comfortable holding a paperback and reading from it. So if the choice is there, I would actually always choose a paperback over a hardback anyway. And my daughter's the same, but I don't know if that means we're weird. No, it depends. I There are certain authors I buy where I like to get the hardback edition just because it's more of a collector's item. So obviously, if you've got hardback versions of the first print run, say, of Ian Fleming's James Bond, which my fiancé has some, get his name in there because he <laughs> does like being mentioned. He has a lovely collection of books. And of course, they then are valuable. So some people, as I said, do like to get a hardback version of their book, even if it costs them 30 quid each book to get printed, just for their own library and to say they got a book printed in hardback. But for a main print run where you're selling it on Amazon and it's a novel, I seriously, I just get a softback. So once you've made your choice of casing type, you then need to think of the type of binding that you want. Now, for a hardback version, you only have two choices. You have a perfect bind or a coil. But for softback options, you have several. And by this, I mean, you can have it perfect bind. And that means obviously with a proper spine. And there are two options on how to do this, but I'll explain that in a bit. Saddle stitched, which is a fancy way to say stapled or a spiral. So that's like for notebooks and stuff. So to recap, hardback books can either be perfect bound or spiral and softbacks can be perfect bound, saddle stitched or spiral. Now, knowing what type of casing and binding is important before you get your cover designed, as it will affect how you design your cover and how it all gets set up. And obviously there are pros and cons for each and I'll try and explain these briefly. Now, going back to the hardback option, dust jackets will require flaps that fold around the casing. And any design for hardback will require a much larger, larger bleed around the edges. Now, I'm going into technical terms. You don't really need to worry about this because your cover designer should know all of this stuff. But I'm just letting you know, if a designer comes back to you explaining that if you want a hardback version and they're going to charge you extra, this is why. So these dust jackets then will wrap around the case and... Another step that hardbacks require are end papers that will then be glued over these folded in edges. Now, end papers are the papers that get stuck onto the back of the actual hardback board. And these end papers will also need to be submitted to the printer because they can be anything from a plain piece of paper to something beautiful. I did one recently a book called The Adventures of Perry and Pippin. They got both a hardback and a softback version. And in the book, there was a lovely picture of one of the rabbits. Um, and behind it was wallpaper with little flowers. So I took one of those flowers and I created a brand new background with all these little flowers. And then the, this was then used as the end paper design. And it looked lovely. And it was a lovely way of tying it in. Now, I mentioned there were also two ways of perfect binding your book. 
And again, this will affect the overall look of your book as well. Now, these won't these next decisions that I talked to you won't make any difference on how you set up your cover files. But you do need to know this because it will affect how much it costs. So with a perfect bind, this means that it's put together like any normal book and it has a flat spine. And um, this is usually where you can have the title of your book and the author name. However, don't forget there's a caveat to this, because if your book doesn't have enough pages, then you won't be able to have anything printed on the spine because the spine size will be too small. And I believe Amazon's minimum page count is 100. For traditional printers, it will be depending on what they can do. So you'll need to talk to them. Anyway, so talking about the perfect bind and how you attach the pages to the actual spine, and there are two ways. One way is that it's glued, which is how most softbacks are put together the pages are glued to the spine and then you've got stitched now I don't mean saddle stitched I mean stitched so what they do is they group pages together in batches of 16 I think and then they sew them into the casing now this is a much more robust way of putting a book together and your book will then lay flat when you open it this method is usually used for notebooks or any other type of book that needs to be opened flat. Now, of course, it's much more expensive because there's much more involved at the printing process, whereas the glued version is perfectly good for any kind of fiction. And usually glued is what is used for any softback novel. However, if you want something that's more like an exercise book or something that's going to be opened a lot, or you need the book to lay flat, that's either softback or hardback, then you need to look at the stitch stitched option. OK, now saddle stitch means something totally different. Saddle stitch means stapled. This is another option that you can of how you put the book together. You wonder why they don't just say stapled. <laughs> I know they just call saddle stitch for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah. So saddle stitch is another option where you've got less paper because it's the cheapest and it's great for coloring books. This is where you need the pages to lay flat and it's very low on page count because obviously if the page count can be done where you get a perfect bind, that is a proper spine, then obviously you're going to want that. But this is for books that are say, I don't know, 12 pages, 20 pages, whatever the minimum is for properly bound, it's whatever's under that. I've just done Laura McLennan's colouring book that was only 24 pages, so we stapled it. But we wanted it laying flat anyway so that people could colour in. Uh, spiral bound is obviously where you have either a metal or plastic spiral wire that is used instead of a spine. And this is great for diaries or notebooks. You can have either a softback or a hardback cover for these, but obviously you won't have anything written on the spine because it's a spiral instead. It isn't a cheap option and you will need to set your files up slightly differently as well because everything is individually placed in the binding. But so you will need to make sure you tell your typesetter before they do any design work if you're planning on having a spiral bound book. Have you ever come across that for non-fiction? Because I, I can't imagine spiral bound fiction, but maybe non-fiction could work, perhaps especially if the text of the book includes exercises and sections well, that need filling in. I just so happen to be reaching <sighs> behind me, <laughs> listeners. So I did a book called The British Flowers Book by Claire Brown. It's a stunning book. I'm holding it up for the camera, not that just so that Alexa one can see I will put a link to this in the show notes this is basically <clears throat> a book that has been designed for florists and bride organizers and what it does is it tells you what flowers what British flowers are in season for any month of the year so and what we decided, because obviously there were some gorgeous pictures, which I'm going to show you. So January, for instance. Ah, oh, yes, I can tell you, listeners, that's beautiful. It goes right across the page. And because it's in the spiral 
form, it just folds flat. And then you can see the text over the picture as well. Exactly. That's lovely. And because this was going to be used by florists, so look, this then indicates all the flowers that you can buy in January that are of that colour scheme. Yeah. Because it was going to be used by florists a lot, we knew that it was it it needed more than glued because it was it needed to be open flat, and spiral is the best way of getting it as flat as could be. Yeah. So and also yeah. you can you know fold it back on itself so that's why we chose spiral for this book it was so that it could be used for the end user so spiral is not cheap it's more expensive to pack it's more expensive to post but for certain projects it's by far the best bind obviously as I've just told you you have a whole myriad of choices and it really does depend on your project I mean I can spend a good few calls discussing the right paper choice as well with my clients because it will all depend on what your printer has to offer. So here are some things to consider before choosing your paper because you're going to also need to know what kind of paper you want. So cost. Different paper will come at a different price point. So obviously to have a think about what paper you like, what your book is in, how you want the book to feel, and how your insides will look. So for instance, if you have a black and white images or photographs, then choosing cream paper might not be a great look. When you know the different price points, you can then obviously go with what you can afford and what's gonna look great for your project. You're also gonna be offered different weights with your paper as well. And weights by weights, I mean thickness. So for instance, 80 gram offset paper, will be your cheapest option. And I believe KDP Amazon offer that. But that type of paper can come in different weights. So you can get either 80 gram, 100 gram, or even 120 gram. And obviously the heavier the weight, the thicker the paper will be. This will then help book, bulk your book out and the paper will obviously feel thicker. But the higher weight you go, the co more cost it is. My printers offers a range, different range of different types of paper and I tend to advise my clients on each specific project depending obviously on their budget as well. Amazon also offers two paper choices for black and white books and they offer two paper choices for colour but remember whatever paper choice you choose especially the weight of it so either you know as I said 80 gram or 120 gram this will then have an impact on the spine size so you'll need to communicate with your cover designer what paper you choose, because that will then give you a spine size that they then need to incorporate on the cover. Amazon has a handy spine calculator, so you can go and work that out. I'll pop a link in the show notes of where you can find it. Although be warned, the dimensions they give you may look really confusing as they include all of the spine sizes and safe areas and cut areas and trim areas and bleed areas it honestly to the unentrained eye you will just look at it going I don't understand which is why you hire professional cover designers yes. I mean who knew there was maths involved in in actually producing your physical book I would definitely need help at this point <laughs> there is there is <laughs> And then the last thing you need to think about in terms of book printing options is your cover finish. So do you want glossy, matte, soft touch lamb or anti-scuff lamb? And by lamb, I mean lamination. Now, soft touch and anti-scuff lamination is a lovely sort of velvety type feel to the finish. And obviously the anti-scuff adds that extra protection if small children are going to be involved if it's a children's book you can also have what's known as spot uv which is where the main cover is matte but then words are picked out and spot picked and they're made shiny obviously each of these options all have a price difference and glossy is the cheapest option amazon give you two choices glossy or matte i love that that lamb, the soft touch lamb and the anti scuff lamb. I've got some lovely soft back murder mysteries. <laughs> a right. murder mystery with a lovely velvet cover. But yeah, I, I love that feel of the cover. Yeah, it's really lovely. I really like it. 
Okay, so now you've made your binding choice, paper choice and cover finish. Where do you get your books printed? Now, I'm a fan of getting a mix of traditional printing and POD, which means printing on demand. Most traditional brick and mortar printers will give you a better product, but of course you'll need to pay for it up front. The more books you get printed in one go, the cheaper they become overall. Of course, with print on demand, you only pay at the time of print and you can literally get one book printed at a time. This is a great option if you don't have any money to spend up front, but it's by far the most expensive way to get your book printed and the quality and choice is never that great. This is why I like to get a mix of both. I encourage my authors to sell their book directly so that they're getting 100% of their cover price and then releasing their book onto print on demand, which is Amazon and also includes in Gram Spark as well. And then what they do is they have, they direct people to their website to sell the book directly and then they can get a signed edition and all the jazz that comes with it. And then about a month later, I encourage them to put their book then up on Amazon and then Amazon can fulfill the orders. They're not really bothered how many they sell on Amazon because they've sold the majority through their website directly. But then at least it's then available to those people that want to buy it online. If you do get a quantity of books printed, because I know sometimes <laughs> when some of our authors have their books delivered, they arrive on these massive great pallets with a big lorry delivering them. And so maybe say you had 500 printed. I do think it's worth just mentioning that if you're selling them privately through your website or, you know, doing book fairs or something, just it's worth remembering how much space they will take up in your house. Now, it might sound like a silly thing, but when I was looking to republish one of my children's series recently, I was offered a hybrid publishing opportunity, you know, which works as a shared risk, if you like. So I would have put some money in to produce the book and the publisher would also put some money in. But I would then have had several hundred copies of this book in my house to sell on. And I don't really have the time to do that. I don't have the time to be marketing a book at the moment. And also my house has no spare space. So where would I put them? I don't have a garage. You know, there were other reasons that I didn't want to pursue that opportunity. But as I say, it may sound like a silly thing, but do be mindful that mm. storage of books, if you decide to get a load printed, is something that you do have to think about. You know, if you don't have storage space, I know there's the quality thing, but if you don't have storage space, perhaps print on demand is a better option for you. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I've obviously got a thousand of my uh, work in progress journals printed. Obviously, we didn't have the option of doing print on demand. And I've literally got I don't know, 60 boxes sitting in my hallway because yeah. I've got nowhere else to store them. So, yeah, it's a very good point, actually. So weigh up all of those pros and cons. But honestly, if you're doing a children's book, so the books may be wide but thin, you can probably stack quite a few books. But I, I always try and encourage my authors to get a load of their books printed by a printer purely for the quality purpose but it's more the fact that you get 100% of your cover price back and then at least you're making some decent money on return obviously with any print on demand no matter where they're going they're going to take their cut and it's usually quite high now you might have noticed that I don't really talk about Ingram very much and that's because I don't actually know it very well I have clients that have uploaded their books to Ingram, but to be honest, I find it a right faff because they charge you for having an account, number one, whereas KDP doesn't. Plus, any time you change your files, as in you want to upload new files, they charge you. Again, KDP don't do that. So I think Ingram is a good choice if you're in the States or Canada, because I know they then supply to some of the bigger book chains. But for the UK, honestly, I think Amazon, as much as I hate to say this, is easier and it's just as effective. All you need to do with Amazon is set up a KDP account, which is where you have your bookshelf. And that's where all the books are printed and distributed by them. And then you can use your regular Amazon login details to set up that account. Now, they need a whole host of other information for that KDP account, but that's why I have a KDP upload service. 
because I'll pop a link in the show notes, because if you're bamboozled by all of the hoops and jumps that you need to go through to set up your KDP account, I can do it with you. And it's super quick. So I think that's everything for printing. I know I've gone on a lot about the different binding type, casing type, how the book is put together. But really, you need to know all of this before you speak to your designer, ideally, because if you suddenly decide that you're going to get your book spirally printed with spiral bound and you haven't told your designer that, they're not going to like you because the files need, all need to be set up differently because the margins need to be different than if you were going to do a softback. So really kind of knowing this before you get your typesetter involved is a really good idea. I mean, um, there is just so much to self-publishing, isn't there? There's probably much more than first time authors realise when you think you even have to consider things like the weight of the paper. Mm -hmm. But as Alexa, too, says, you're not on your own. You know, there are professionals out there like her who know what they're doing and can support you through these final crucial stages. And it's so important to get them right, because once you've gone through all the stages of editing and proofreading to refine and polish what you've written and you've really invested in that, you need to keep that sense of investment going right through to the end of the publishing process so that when you hold your book in your hands for the first time, you know it's right and it's something to really be proud of. Yeah, this is why I, I used to, this is why my job can be really stressful sometimes, I used to not offer a proof copy. And what I mean by a proof copy is a printed proof copy of a book. So I would literally, from the P flat PDF, author would approve it, I'd send it off, and then the next thing they receive is their 500 books. The stress in that, from my point of view as a designer, is horrible because seeing something as a PDF flat on your computer is very different from actually seeing it as a physical thing. This is now why I always, always have a printed proof sent to the author so they can see the physical thing in their hands before we then commit to 200, 500 or 1,000 books being printed. And I tell you what, it has saved my bacon more than once because, okay, people see the book on the computer but that doesn't then tell them what size it's actually going to be in their hands when they hold it. It also doesn't show them exactly what the color is going to look like, because what you see on screen and what gets printed are two different things and actually how it feels in your hands. So having that extra step in my process, having the proof ha has just relieved the stress so much because it's also a catch safe. I always get the authors to look and make sure they're happy with what the proof looks like. And then they have a chance. If there's anything glaringly obvious wrong, they have a chance of fixing it. And I tell you what, Alexa, nine times out of 10, when someone gets a proof, 2% go on to then hit print. 98%, there will always be something else to fix. That's really interesting. I know it's really different having the physical copy in your hand because I, years ago when I was first proofreading and editing, publishers would always send hard copies of everything. So I'd be marking up with a red pen. And, and when originally the switch was to the computer screen, it felt like such a different thing to be. Mm. I felt like I can't, I can't actually grasp this book. So I can't, how am I supposed to edit it properly when I'm just doing it on a screen? Obviously that was years ago, so I've got used to it now. But there is something very, very different about reading your book off the page of the physical paper than seeing it you know as you say particularly when it there's illustrations and you've got colors involved that are going to look different on the page from how they do on the screen exactly mm. so this adding this extra step has just made my life so much less stressful because before I mean I'm going to confess to this one of my biggest errors that I did when I was just starting out oh and by the way tomorrow so we're recording this on the 9th of the 11th. Tomorrow, the 10th, is my business birthday. Oh, happy business birthday. How old? 14 years. 
14 years old. Oh, I remember those days. <laughs> so when I was probably in my first, this is either in my first or second year of, of doing this, I spelt an author's name wrong on the spine. Ooh. And we didn't obviously have proof. I mean, he had signed off on the PDF proof, so I wasn't totally at fault, but we didn't have a physical proof being sent out back then. So we got 500 books with the wrong name on the spine. Yes, not good. So this is why I not only have, and I'm showing Alexa one my print cover checklist now that covers everything. This is why I also send out a proof because I think there's nothing like holding a physical book in your hands, seeing how it looks on the page. And also sometimes, especially for children's books, when you open the book, sometimes the picture might need to be moved over to the left or the right, depending on where it fits on the spine because of how the book opens. So I get a copy as well. So I get a proof and the author gets a proof. And then it just makes my life so much less stressful. If you're working with someone that doesn't offer a proof copy at this stage, yeah, be warned because it's very different from seeing it on screen to in your hands. But anyway, if you have any questions about all of this, then do come and join the Writers Refinery Facebook group because that's probably the best place to do it. And it's the best way to get some support. So come and uh, the link is obviously in the show notes. Next week, we're going to be looking at other formats that your book can come in. So by that, I mean eBooks. And there is a misnomer about what eBooks means, which I will be sharing in that podcast, because terminology is really important when you're dealing with books. So we'll be looking at what eBook actually means and audiobooks, and otherwise you can deliver a book to your audience. So from me, business birthday at 13, almost 14, bye-bye. <laughs> and from me, happy birthday on your business birthday. I don't actually think I know when my business birthday is, but it's sometime in September years ago. <laughs> there you go. You should know what it is, and then you can then you can let people can know. Do a thing, yeah, yeah, maybe mm. it was, yeah, I'll figure it out. Okay. <laughs> All right. So bye-bye okay. from me. And bye-bye from me. Bye-bye.